preparing live stream. Okay, we're there. All right. <laughs> we made it. This is a grand experiment. And uh, we have two people watching. So, so far, that's great. Good. So it's eight o'clock. Um, so we should get started on time. Usually Upper Dublin, we start everything about at least five minutes late, or at least people arrive five minutes late. So that's bound to happen. Um, but I want to welcome everybody to our first uh, Facebook Live event uh, from Upper Dublin Lutheran Church's Faith at Home Project. And I'm delighted to be joined by my friend Bethany Stoley, a uh, friend of mine and a friend of uh, Upper Dublin Lutheran Church. Um, and our topic tonight is Teens and Digital Media, What Parents Need to Know, uh, which is a lot. So it's a topic on many of our minds. I have a 14-year-old and I have a tween and I have nine-year-olds. So um, we have a lot coming down the pike. So uh, I think we're having this as much for me as for everybody else um, who's tuning in um, on Facebook tonight. Um, so let me tell you a little bit uh, about Bethany uh, by way of introduction, and then uh, we'll get started. Um, so Bethany is the founder of Stoli Creative. Um, she's a design researcher, an interaction designer, curriculum developer, and design evangelist. Um, and after nearly a decade in religious publishing with a focus on youth ministry resources, she now works as a researcher on product design at Blackboard, creating applications to help students learn. Uh, and as I said before, we're um, friends and we dabble in lots of different digital spaces together and uh, it's fun to collaborate on this. Um, so we invite you uh, on Facebook to uh, post your comments and questions uh, in the comments below the video. And we're gonna be keeping track of those tonight. So as Bethany presents, we're gonna take times for Q and A so go ahead and post your questions. And when we pause, um, I'll check the comments and we'll discuss those. So we'll take breaks periodically through the time and then we'll have some time at the end for Q&A as well. So maybe if you wanna practice that, if you're there, maybe you wanna share in the comments uh, where you're watching from. So what town or state or country you might be tuning in from tonight. It'd be cool to have a sense of where people are and how you're joining us. Um, and this is our first time hosting um, a live event. So please forgive any technical glitches that we might have along the way. Those are all on me if they come about, um, but we will do our best. And we are recording this. So if um, you haven't joined us yet and you've you're tuning in late or um, you have to step away for whatever reason, uh, we'll have a recording of this posted uh, afterward too. So you can go back and check it out. And we're gonna make the slides available and uh, some of the links as well tonight and then uh, in the future. So you can uh, check it out and go back if you miss something. Um, so with all that, I'm gonna pass it to Bethany and she's gonna tell us what parents need to know about teens and digital media. Okay, let's see if I can uh, do this right. And pull over, are you seeing a black spot in the... Um, I'm seeing your slide on the webinar. Okay. I know sometimes I've had the, uh, the little camera window or the mm. chat window that creates a little spot that's not visible, but it looks like everything's working. Great, well, first of all, um, thank you so much for inviting me to talk about this. Uh, you have the burden or benefit of the 45 minute version of what I've been thinking about around youth and technology and design and relationships for the last five or more years. Um, but a couple of um, background pieces. One, first of all, my posture toward technology is not one of fear. So you will probably see that um, represented throughout here. Uh, I have a little challenge for you as we get started. Um, before I begin, as a little experiment, I'd like your help. Um, get out your phone or if you're logging in from Facebook, um, you can use Facebook. But I want you to send a message to a teen that you know and I want you to ask them the first two questions that you see on the screen here. The third one's extra credit if you want to do that. Um, but send a quick, quick message to a teen asking, who's the last person you communicated with using your phone? What app did you use? And then if you want to, why did you connect with them? Um, just a warning too, they may text you back or message you back and say like, why are you asking this? So you can blame me if you want to. 
So once you've done that, um, just hold on to those messages and we'll loop back to them later on. So before we start and really dive in, I wanna be upfront about my biases and my assumptions. Uh, first, my background. I have a background in youth and family ministry. I studied that at Augsburg College. And then after that, I spent about a decade at Augsburg Fortress and Spark House where I developed youth ministry curriculum. Um, out of that experience and that education, I am deeply convicted of several things. One, uh, young people are smart and capable. Also, I think that youth are theologians. They aren't the future of the church. They are the church right now. Um, I think the call to adults who work with young people or our parents is to come alongside and encourage and support teens as they grow in faith. And this also isn't a one-way street. It's a mutual journey. Adults have a lot to learn from young people. Uh, I'm also a designer. An interaction designer is what I often call myself, and I'm a design researcher. Uh, so I work for an educational company called Blackboard, where I lead design research activities that help us humanize technology. So we want to support students in their academic journeys and help instructors be effective teachers. Um, that involves, you know, sketching out storyboards and working with a variety of digital tools, um, conducting user interviews and usability tests and creating screens for websites and mobile apps. But at the core of everything that we do in design, we're thinking about relationships. These are relationships between people, uh, relationships between people and technology, and the relationships we have with one another through our technology. And the other thing is design is founded on empathy. So that's the raw material that we start from. Um, it's not just a tactical step-by-step -step process of creating something, but we really try to take into account emotions that shape a person's experience and how those emotions play into them being successful at Blackboard if it's in school, but in the church world, um, thinking about what are the emotions at play. So that's the long way of saying that this session is not going to list the top apps that, that teens are using and how they're utilizing them. Um, those lists are constantly changing as new apps are developed um, and the culture and practice around technology shifts continually. I'm also not gonna analyze what technology is good or bad. Again, there are plenty of other resources out there that can do that. Um, I don't think technology is a neutral medium, but I do tend toward a bit of optimism. I don't really buy into the clickbait headlines that um, the latest app is gonna destroy youth as we know it and ruin our future. <laughs> um, but I also am not so optimistic that I think technology is a panacea to, all, to solve all of our problems. So instead, um, I think the alternative title for this session could be, what does it mean to live in public? I wanna step back and wonder, how is technology shaping our society and our interactions with one another? How are young people immersed in and using digital media? How does digital media shape identities? And then what are the implications for those of us in ministry who care about teenagers? So I wanna provide us tools to not only understand what's happening, but to empathize with youth as they figure out who they are in a digital age. So if that sounds good to you, um, hold on because we are about to dive in. This might be a whirlwind. So the first concept, I have a few concepts I wanna lay out for you and then we'll dive into some Q and A. The first one is the idea of networked individualism. This, coin, uh, this term was coined by Lee Rainey at the Pew Research Center's Internet and American Life Project and by Barry Wellman, who's a sociologist and former professor at University of Toronto. So they published a book called uh, Networked, The New Social Operating System. Basically, they say that new digital technology is not killing society. Um, complex, uh, complex social networks have always existed. However, how we organize ourselves is, uh, how we organize ourselves socially is shifting. Um, in large part thanks to mobile phones, the internet, and other technological advances. So Wellman lays out three models of community and work social networks that have evolved significantly in the past 100 years or so. The first one is called little boxes. So these are homogenous, densely knit, geographically bound kinships. Think about work, home, neighborhoods, community groups, churches. We live, work, and socialize within these close-knit groups. Uh, and this isn't true just for rural communities or agrarian tribes. Even in large cities around 100 years ago, people
people tended to travel within the boundaries of their own neighborhoods and didn't really venture out far beyond. The other model, the next model, is glocalization, which is an amalgamation of the words global and local. So think about cars, planes, phones, email. These social and technological changes um, enabled communities to form around shared interests. So they didn't have to be bound by shared physical location. So in a glocalized model, people and places are still connected, but social closeness doesn't mean physical closeness. Um, so for example, people might cross neighborhoods or cities to spend time with their friends, with their colleagues, and with their families. Think about a recent trip that you maybe took beyond your own community. So the third and present model they call networked individualism. So glocalization isn't bound to a single geographic location, but it's still largely about physical places where socialization happens. You go from a place to another place. But in networked individualism, it's a move from place to place to connectivity person to person. Um, having a home base is almost irrelevant when you can carry a phone or tablet or computer and you still maintain all of your connections. It's not bound to a home base, a physical location. So the individual now is at the center as opposed to a place at the center. And on top of that, you can, multi you can occupy multiple places at one time. So um, some of you might even be doing that right now. You are checking email or tweeting or texting or otherwise engaging with people outside of your physical space. I mean, the fact that we're on this very session right now is an instant, uh, instance of networked individualism. So there's a lot more great stuff in Rainey and Wellman's book. Um, I encourage you to check it out, but the TLDR, so that's internet speak too long, didn't read. The synopsis is, uh, is this. So complex social networks have always existed, but the nature of how we organize ourselves socially has shifted. We've moved from the tight-knit, geographically bound, door-to-door, -door, tiny boxes, toward place-to-place -to -place localized networks that are bound by interests instead of physical proximity, and now to person-to-person -person networks centered on the individual rather than a location at all. Uh, and then the other thing to remember is that individuals can inhabit multiple places at once, regardless of their physical location. Take a quick breath. <laughs> Concept number two. Um, to frame what's happening theologically and culturally. And this concept helps us understand the implications for understanding teens and media. So Dana Boyd is a social media scholar, uh, and she does a lot of research and advocacy around youth and technology. She's at Microsoft, Harvard, NYU, MIT fellow. Uh, she's one of the leading voices on all things around youth and tech. And one concept she writes about in her book, It's Complicated, The Social Lives of Networked Teens, is networked publics. So if you think about going out in public, traditionally that meant some sort of open physical space. Maybe it's a park or a mall or a coffee shop. Uh, networked publics, in contrast, enable us to be a part of a broader community, but the space isn't necessarily a physical location. So when you think about the, de the adolescent uh, developmental task, it's really around teens figuring out where they fit in society. Uh, but now, they turn to Facebook and Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, and other social media platforms as they participate in public life. It's not so much going to the mall or the park. And this is for multiple reasons, um, especially in the last 20 to 30 years, public life has been characterized by fear. Think about the 24 seven news cycles that heighten our anxiety about, anxiety about everything from stranger danger to terrorism, to drugs, to mass shootings. Malls have implemented curfews, and many public spaces have introduced anti-loitering laws. So that restricts the movement of teens in public spaces. At the same time, kids are facing an incredible amount of pressure. Between school homework, uh, any activities and community service to strengthen a college application, uh, for middle and upper class families, highly structured daily life, extracurriculars, sports, music, uh, and then there's also the logistical challenges of transportation when you factor in single parent households, homes where both parents work and that sort of thing. So when Dana was doing research with teens, she saw that they really just wanted to hang out with friends. But 
pressures, fears, and logistics limited these opportunities. Even for kids who had freedom and space to hang out, it didn't matter if their friends didn't have that flexibility. And then compounded by fewer public spaces, especially that were free of adult or parental surveillance. So it's not shocking that youth turn to the publics that are available to them. So for example, one of my friends, um, his tween daughter wanted to play with her friend, but between her family where there were three kids, two working parents, it couldn't happen logistically. So she and her friend crafted their own workaround. They each set up their phones and iPod touches, open up FaceTime and found a way to spend time together. So these, there are definitely challenges of living in networked publics that are hard for teens to navigate because the boundaries of a public aren't always apparent. Even for me, as I present right now, I'm in a networked public. I don't actually know who's watching this on the Facebook live feed, who's watching this after the fact, who's uh, attending the Zoom webinar. So if I were in front of you, I could make adjustments to how I present myself, to my voice if I wanted to get a bit of privacy, but I can't see the boundaries of this space. The other thing is, uh, another challenge is that different networks and contexts can suddenly collapse and create an awkward moment. So I gave um, a talk at a conference about a year and a half ago and was interacting with friends and professional connections on Facebook. And then my mom chimes in with an encouraging comment that's a little bit awkward given the context. Um, there's nothing like social media to make me feel like an uncomfortable, embarrassed teen again. I love you, mom but it's a little bit awkward. <laughs> so what that points to is how challenging it is to navigate what Dana Boyd calls context collapse. Worlds can collide in an online space and it's more complicated when you talk about social media and persistence. Um, when something can be revisited later by someone who wasn't part of the original exchange. In the physical realm, if you think about a group of teens, if a teacher approaches, all of a sudden they can get quiet and they get privacy. But online, you can't change the conversation and it's harder to manage the social norms because you have to think about time, over, uh, temporal considerations, not just the moment. So there are some behaviors emerging as youth develop tools to manage context collapse. On Instagram, if you don't get 50 likes, you delete it. Uh, there's a sense of curation and identity. So they'll delete what's perceived to control what's perceived as cool or good so that they can look polished and popular. Or teens might also delete in an effort to control their social media history. Teens also are good at using coded language to communicate to one audience and conceal their message to another. So Dana Boyd talks about a Latina teen who broke up with her boyfriend. Uh, typically when she was on social media, she used uh, song lyrics to communicate her emotions but she knew that if she posted a lyric from a depressing emo song, her mom might overreact because it happened in the past. So instead she posts lyrics from the song, always look on the bright side of life. But what she meant was the song from the Monty, Monty Python film, Life of Brian, which is sung by Brian and others while hanging from crosses. She's Argentinian, so she knew her mom wouldn't get the British cultural reference, but she'd recently watched the film with her friends, so she knew her friends would get it. Her mom immediately commented that it was great to see her happy. Meanwhile, her friends immediately texted to check in on her. So there's a lot of great stuff in Dana Boyd's work. I'd encourage you to check out her book. Uh, she offers it for free on her website and it's really enlightening. But the too long didn't read version is this. At the heart of it, teens desire social interaction. Uh, when physical incarnate publics aren't available, they move to networked publics. The challenges are that it's hard to navigate context collapse, but teens are increasingly resourceful finding ways around and through these challenges. At the core, teen behavior isn't necessarily fundamentally shifting. And as Dana says, what's novel for the public life it enables. Okay, quick breather. First round of questions. All right. Well, we have uh, a question from Braden French, who's all the way list, watching all the way in Sydney, Australia. And Braden asks, uh, I appreciate the concept of networked individualism. What merit, if any, do you give to the push to help young people disconnect or switch off? 
Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think there are definitely times and great opportunities to um, disconnect and find other ways because I think at the heart, whoops, what did I do here? Um, I think at the heart, people are trying to form connections. Um, let me see if I can find my screen again. <laughs> um, did I lose you totally? No, I'm here. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so I think at the heart, what teens are wanting are connections with one another. Um, I do think there is a shift in individual to individual connections um, away from those places. So I think as we have opportunities to find other ways to engage socially with one another, that's always beneficial. Um, I think also there's other research showing that teens are um, facing addiction issues related to their devices. So finding ways to manage that is important as well. Um, speaking as someone who works in technology and is engaged in conversations that around ethics and technology, there are a lot of designers who aren't necessarily thinking through the implications of the, um, the Pavlovian effect to constantly check our devices and the pull of those alerts. Um, they're interested in how do we serve up more eyeballs to advertisers and make more money. Um, so I think efforts to disconnect and engage in relationship formation and identity formation um, in other contexts is really valuable as well. Great. I think those are all the questions uh, at the moment. Um, so thank you, Brayden. Thanks for tuning in all the way from Australia. Well, it's Great. the middle of the day or the middle of the night. So thanks. Well, um, so I'll keep moving forward. Um, so when we talk about teens, we often talk about them being digital natives. Um, I think that that term belies the challenges that youth do encounter when it comes to technology. Uh, there's also the factor that not all teens have equal access to the internet or technological liter literacy is learnable. Um, many older people can be as tech fluent, if not more than teens. So I'm not gonna show this video, but I sent um, Keith a link to share. Uh, it's a great video from the Fine Brothers. They do these uh, React videos. And this one is Teens React to Windows 95. Uh, it's a funny and enlightening reminder of how much technology has changed as a whole bunch of teenagers are asked to um, play around with an old computer that's loaded with Windows 95 and log into the internet using a modem, which many of them didn't even know what it is. They're wondering how they connect their phone, their cell phone to the computer because it has to connect over a phone line. Um, so there's a lot of interesting things that sort of make me feel old. Um, <laughs> but it exposes a lot of assumptions that young people have about how computers and digital media work. Um, and one of my favorite lines from it was um, a couple of the teens who said that they were born after Windows 95, which made me feel a little bit out of touch. Uh, so about a year ago, out of curiosity, I did a little research and put together a quick timeline to see how different technological shifts align with the life of an 18 year old. So this was from 1998 to you know, a teen who graduated in 2016. When they were born, instant messaging was becoming big. AIM, which just died. ICQ, which is no longer. Google, which is big now. 99 was Vlogger, Zanga, and LiveJournal, and TiVo. Uh, in 2000, when they were toddlers, the dot-com crash happened and Pandora Radio started. When they're in preschool, uh, the iPod, was released. 2002 was the year of Friendster. Uh, as they're in kindergarten in 2003, MySpace and iTunes take hold. And then the year after, Facebook, Gmail, Motorola Razor, Flickr, World of Warcraft. The year after that, 2005, YouTube and Reddit became big. After that was um, kind of the trend of consoles, gaming consoles with Nintendo Wii, PlayStation 4, Xbox 360, which were probably pretty formative for their youth or their uh, childhood years. 2007 was big with Twitter, Tumblr, iPhone, iPod Touch, Halo 3, Netflix streaming. And then the year after, Android operating system. Middle school is when Kickstarter and Uber started, followed by iPad, Pinterest, Instagram. In 2011, Emoji, which are probably pretty central to their communication tools, 
um, were av first available on iOS. Spotify became available in the US. 2012, which doesn't seem that long ago, was when they entered high school. And that's when Snapchat came out, Candy Crush, and Lyft. So that's been formative their entire high school career. 2013, Hotmail finally shut down. Yik Yak became big and then died pretty quickly. Vine, PlayStation 4. Um, 2014, GoPro Hero 4, Oculus Rift uh, virtual reality headset. 2015 was some video streaming apps, um, Apple Watch, Chromecast, and who knows what's going to be ahead of us. A few things that are also helping me frame the life that um, these teenagers have lived. Amazon was invented before they were born. They've never known a world before uh, without Google or Wi-Fi. Uh, they were third graders with the explosion of video gaming consoles. And as you think about the future, they'll probably be the early adopters for self-driving cars, virtual reality, or whatever the next major technological advance is. So not every teen is using all of these te uh, technologies or is even fluent in them, but they are using them at high rates. Um, I'm not going to go through all of this, but in 2015, Common Sense Media surveyed 2,600 teens and tweens nationally. And tweens spend four and a half hours a day in front of screens. Uh, uh, teens averaged six and a half hours a day. Now, some of that's multi-screen, uh, multi-screening or multitasking, but that still is a lot of time per day. A majority have tablets, um, and they spend more time consuming media than creating. Uh, Pew Research Center came out with a report in 2015, and they shifted their methodology from phone calls to online because they knew they would get more responses. So for that reason, these um, stats aren't compared to previous studies to show trends, but the data shows and in, provides an interesting snapshot of the current state. I mean, 91% of teens use the internet on a mobile device, and this is 2015, so I can only assume those numbers have increased. 71% use more than one social media site. A lot of teens don't know how many friends or followers they have on various platforms. So some interesting stats there that just show how much teens are just swimming in the waters of technology. Um, here's a breakdown of which social networks were used most often by American teens. I found it interesting that Facebook topped, but in some ways that's kind of table stakes. Um, it's expected for teens to create an account, but their, an their attitudes are ambivalent toward it. Uh, it's, it's the new email. You don't necessarily get excited about using it, but it's something that you still have to sign up for. Um, as I mentioned early on, I'm not going to get into the good and bad parts of various social media platforms or how much teens are online. Um, but I do think these reports point to some interesting considerations for those of us who care about young people. Navigating dating and relationships can become much more challenging. Most teens don't actually seek out significant others online, uh, but texting and social media are really critical for staying connected with a romantic partner. Teens will post a status or a bio update or a photo, and that's how they publicly establish a relationship. Uh, at the same time, continuous connection through mobile devices raises expectations for more frequent communication. And it can complicate things if a partner is caught snapping or tweeting, but not responding to their significant other's text. So there are a lot more complications in romantic relationships thanks to social media and digital technology. And then there's the whole breakup thing. Um, I loved the, that's like eighth grade stuff to break up by a text. Uh, most teens agree that it's best to break up in person, but text breakups are still really common. And then the pair needs to figure out what to do after breaking up. If they stay friends on social media, maybe you've seen people scrub their profiles and untake photos to reduce exposure or even evidence that the relationship ever existed, or they'll unfollow or even block. So it's much more complicated na navigating the breakup world when your posts are persistent. And then much like their evolving norms around dating in a social media world, teens are developing their own social and cultural rules for each of these platforms. Uh, earlier I mentioned that some te teens delete any Instagram posts that don't get a minimum threshold of likes, but there are other subtle subliminal ways that teens signal to one another through social media. Like how many Ys are in a hey? <laughs> Uh, in an episode of This American Life, 
called Status Report, Ira Glass talks with a group of teen girls about how they use Instagram. The, um, Keith will share a link to the episode, and I'm not going to get into it here, but it's a really revealing look at selfies, at social standing, at gossip, and how people screenshot or maybe um, share and circulate their selfie before they're posting it, and then how these girls navigate social norms via Instagram. It's the very beginning of the session, and the 10, 12 minutes is totally worth it. So basically, the TLDR version, youth were born in an internet-saturated era, and they're deeply engaged in, but also shaped by digital media. Uh, they're making up the rules as they go and creating new social norms and patterns, as well as language to engage with one another in these public spaces. Questions? Yes, yeah, so um, we've got a good number of folks watching and commenting, so welcome everybody. Um, I have a question from Carol. It says, she asks, um, will seniors ever be connected with the teens of our church? So I think she's getting at teens seem to live this incredibly different life, almost like they're living in two different, like a different reality, uh, which in many ways they are, as you describe it. And, um, and so how do we bridge the connections, not just between um, teens and seniors, but even sometimes, you know, teens and you know, Gen Xers um, like me? Yeah, I mean, I think at the heart of it, what teens are seeking is relationship. So whether that's mediated through technology, or if that happens by, you know, sitting down with one another or through a, an intergenerational event or a service project, I think more opportunities to connect um, regardless of how that connection is made or mediated um, is really valuable because we're still humans. <laughs> they might have very different experiences, but we're still all people. Um, the other thing too, like I mentioned very early on is I believe in the mutuality piece that um, it's not just about adults imparting wisdom and teaching teens about how, uh, about what it means to grow in faith. But I think adults have a lot to learn from teens as well. So if you can establish a relationship that's founded on um, respect and trying to learn from one another and empathy, that goes a long way to, um, to start to bridge what feels like a big chasm. Great. Um, another question from Reagan. Uh, what are the implications for teens who do not participate in these platforms, uh, if any? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good question. It would be interesting to find out from those teens um, why they do or do not participate. Um, I think some are trying to, uh, I mean, some of it is probably its own sense of trying on different identities. And um, whereas you might've had like goth kids or emo kids or that sort of thing who take a different um, path culturally, uh, that may be some of what people are doing by rejecting social media uh, and different digital media. I think it would be important to talk to those teens and find out what's at the root of um, choosing to or not to participate. Great, great. The questions are rolling in now. So uh, Laura has a question. Um, any research on the extent of time on social media slash screen time in association with performance in school or emotional health? Ooh, um, I don't know right offhand. Um, I know that there have been some reports more recently and I can do a little more research and try to share some out. Um, around the negative psychological effect and more teens that are dealing with anxiety and depression that may correlate with time spent online. Um, there are also teens that are getting far less sleep because they're sleeping next to their phones, uh, which can impact probably school performance, uh, mental health issues. And so that's again where I think the ethical challenge to people who are designing technology is to think not just about how do they um, serve the business owners and stakeholders and get more advertising revenue, but what are also the responsibilities to not just creating um, a reactive culture, um, but how can we start to go a little bit more deeper into either creative work or um, thinking about opportunities for reflection, not just selecting the red circle because <laughs> there's a new notification. Great. Um, we'll take one more now and then um, we'll one more question now, and then we'll have time for questions uh, a little later on. But Christina asks about um, the effectiveness of parental controls. So um, 
what are the the trade-offs I think she's sort of getting at um you know do we damage relationships by having our kids feel like we're, we're looking over their shoulders can it um you know maybe what's the appropriate level of keeping an eye on it being um aware without being intrusive yeah um I think that's a difficult balance to strike. Um, I know there's different uh, services out there like Circle and others that you can use to set different controls or time limits. Honestly, I think the best way to set, um, to, to deal with parental controls is a conversation uh, and figuring out, you know, establishing the boundaries for you as a family um, between the teens and parents and other kids in the household. Um, because I, <laughs> teens are really good at figuring out the controls. Um, so many of them will figure out how to bypass it before you even realize it anyway. Um, and the technology is constantly changing. So a filter that works for right now may not work uh, a year from now. Um, so I think, again, the best um, place to start is to figure out like what are the um, values and virtues that you as a family want to uphold, whether it's in person or in a digital online space. And I mean, I don't know that behavior is fundamentally changing. Um, teens that are, you know, a lot of times there's fear around sexting or that sort of thing. The interesting thing is um, that uh, I think teen pregnancy and sexual activity has actually dropped uh, for this generation of teens. I'll have to look up the study itself, um, but some of that's attributed to <laughs> teens spending more time online as opposed to actually dating. Um, so we hear a lot about the hookup culture, um, but it might be more of a sex culture, who knows. Um, but I think fundamentally what it comes down to is uh, what are the, how, how do you create an environment where teens know that they're loved and cared about, um, that you as much as possible can foster an open and understanding relationship. And um, as I'll talk to kind of moving on, how do you surround your teens with a number of other adults who care about and love them? and can be the people that they talk to when they don't necessarily want to talk to you. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, yeah, let's, uh, great segue. Let's uh, move on to the next section. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, so I want to rewind history a little bit further than the past 10 years of social media and maybe the past 18 years in these teens' lives. Um, I don't think what they're dealing with and what we as parents and leaders are concerned about is anything new. Uh, bear with me here because I'm going to talk about Genevieve Bell. Uh, she's an anthropologist who works at the intersection of technology and cultural practice, uh, teaching at Australian National University and advising Intel as a senior fellow. So um, Genevieve has this great story that goes back to the 1730s. That year, a French clockmaker and engineer named Jacques de Vaucanson, uh, I don't know, I don't speak French, uh, but he engineered a duck. But it wasn't just a toy. He was fascinated with anatomy and created a mechanical duck. It waddled like a real duck, it flapped its wings, it wagged its tail, and it quacked. It even ate like a duck. And here's the thing, it pooped. Now, it didn't actually have a digestive system, but there were a couple of compartments. So whatever it ate went into one chamber. And apparently the um, clockmaker, Vaucanson, must have had someone gather duck poop uh, which was then stored and eventually expelled from a different chamber. So this duck was a huge hit. He traveled all over Europe and crowds flocked to see this mechanical duck that behaved like a real one. Uh, while this is a silly story, it's significant because this waddling, eating, pooping mechanical duck suggested that we could use engineering to make things come to life. So if you fast forward through the next 200 years, and look at literature, art, theater, engineering, and film, you'll see a number of portrayals of non-alive things coming to life. Frankenstein's monster, robots, Skynet. And notice that with most of these depictions, at least for narratives that come out of Western culture, the artificial intelligence or monster or robot is a threat to humans. Now, it doesn't have to be this way. In Japan, robots are friends and partners with humans. I recently saw a video of a robot hotel that opened in Nagasaki, and there really aren't people there. You walk in and you're greeted by animatronic uh, people-like figures or dinosaurs, and your room is filled with robots. But in Western uh, culture, new technology, whether it's clocks or steam engines or horseless carriages or the internet and social media, 
these shift our relationship to time. And they also change our relationship to space and or our, our social relationships. So whenever this happens, a change in our relationship to time, space, or social relationships, we project our anxieties onto the mechanical or digital world. So we think the robots will kill us. We think that the new technology is, is fundamentally changing the way the world works and our place in it. So basically, TLDR, when technology takes on lifelike properties or changes our temporal, spatial, or social relationships, we start asking, what makes us different? What makes us special? What makes us human? Uh, these questions sound a lot like the questions adolescents are asking. Who am I? Why am I here? What makes me special? Questions about identity that are relevant for faith formation. So theologian Andy Root talks about how our identities used to be tied up in what we did and who we loved. This was great and meant for a relatively stable sense of self when people retired with a gold watch after working the same job for 50 years and they generally married and stayed married. But all of that has been in flux as a majority of millennials plan to stay in a job for fewer than three years and that trend isn't likely to reverse with this new generation as they enter the workforce. And the way that people form relationships and start families and get married evolves even more as texting and dating sites and hookup apps expand options to find romantic partners, but also create a whole new set of challenges. Now, when teenagers are dealing with these difficult identity formation questions, they don't always have the experience or tools to find a path forward. The first challenge is that youth are curating digital avatars to present their optimal selves. It might be taking 20 photos before getting one worthy of a selfie, or unfriending someone who's become unpopular, or strategically liking and commenting to get the attention of a friend or romantic interest. But when every profile photo looks happy, we might miss the pain uh, that someone's hiding beneath the surface. And other youth who may realize a friend is dealing with relationship troubles or mental health issues or family problems don't always know how to connect the friend to resources that could help. Another challenge is online drama. In the realm of social media, a small interaction or snub or a piece of gossip, gossip can escalate really quickly because users can respond and tag team, not to mention screen capping to keep evidence or insurance for the future. In an interview with Krista Tippett for the On Being radio show, uh, Dana Boyd talks about how as a teen, she shaved her head to upset her mother and it worked. Her mother got super worked up. When she saw her grandmother a short time later, her grandma said, hmm, looks like you were in the Holocaust. And that simple statement got her to rethink what she was trying to represent. Um, when teens approach the internet, adults don't necessarily know better than they do, uh, or at, sorry, as far as our approach to the internet, adults don't necessarily know better than teens do, but we can ask questions that force reflection that's actually productive. So it's less about surveillance which gets to the question we talked about earlier, and more about conversation. We move away from prescriptions to encourage young people to be critically reflective. Now that's easier said than done. Um, in this interview, Dana talks about how that typically was done collectively as a society, but the present puts burden on parents. Um, we've architected society to put the educational responsibility on just a few adults. So her challenge is to build out a network of other adults in your child's life from the time they're two, really, um, because at some point they're not going to want to talk to you, a parent, and you can't do it yourself. And it's a disservice to assume that you can handle everything um, your teen throws at you. So there's a great link that I'll ask uh, Keith to share from this interview. But ultimately, I don't think protectionism and surveillance is the route to address these challenges. If we're caring adults in ministry and we wanna build relationships, we need to be with, present with young people in the places they inhabit, whether that's physical or digital. This creates space that we can gently support them and nurture them and help teens develop into thoughtful adults. In the world of youth ministry, there's an adage about, about flipping the ratio. So instead of one adult for every five kids, every kid in the congregation should know five caring adults. 
So if we applied that concept to digital spaces where youth live, what would that look like? Youth aren't necessarily taking more risks than previous generations, but the ones they take tend to be more visible. Um, this, I think, is a ministry opportunity, not one for judgment, but for engagement. An engagement that doesn't have to be constrained to Sunday or Wednesday, if that's when you're volunteering with young people, or a time that you're even gathered together in a physical space. We're living in a social model of networked individualism, so it's about a person-to-person -person connection. When I was teaching confirmation, I did this silly little thing with my small group. Um, I had an experiment one week to try to foster more connection among the girls. And so I said, every day, text everyone else in the group. And it could be anything from, you know, how are you? But other times I would ask questions like, would you rather live in a tree house or on a houseboat? It was silly, but even little one word or single phrase responses actually bind us together. They're forms of phatic communication and create a sense of connectedness, of personal availability and relational intensity. It's like, it's the like button or a comment or an emoji. Um, as I once heard from an interaction designer who worked for Facebook, a relationship is built up of small interactions over time. So the next week when we gathered, the group dynamic was different, even through the silly little check-ins because they formed us. So that brings me back to that first activity we did, and then I'll wrap up. I'll take a pause for just a moment. Um, if one or two of you texted or messaged a young person, um, did you hear back from them? Anything surprising? I'm also wondering how quickly you heard back. And you can share those in the comments um, right here alongside the video and let us know. And if you didn't join in the beginning, I'd encourage you to message a team you know using whatever format you want and ask the first two questions and possibly the third. Um, what you might not realize is that I made you do a little empathetic research based on my background in design. Um, so in the world of design, a core way to come up with new ideas and strategies is through developing empathy for users or in this case, empathy for teens. So my challenge for you after you sign off with this work, from this workshop is to become a designer and an anthropologist. Identify a teen that you wanna learn from, possibly one you're not related to, and you know, go to coffee, go out somewhere. Ask them to show you what apps they have on their phone. See if they'll show you a few photos they posted to Instagram, or if they'll recap a recent group text, cause it's probably there. Ask them to tell stories about what they're, going, what they're doing through digital media, who they're spending time with and why, or if they're abstaining from digital media, find out that, that could be insightful too. And make yourself an apprentice to try to learn from them. Because at the heart of it, I love this quote from John Green, who's an author and a blogger. He writes young adult fiction. I believe when we listen to young people and don't condescend to them, we don't need translators at all. A really great book is from youth ministry professor Andrew Zersky. Phones matter, but it's not because of the, the gadget. In this book, he talks about the moth myth. We think youth are attracted to a device, but if you deleted all the contacts, uninstalled the apps and turned off any sort of internet connection, teens wouldn't really use it. They care about their phones and digital media because these technologies hold their relationships. So my challenge and encouragement and commission to you as you leave today's session is this. Recognize that we live in a society of networked individuals and networked publics, but we don't need to be afraid of technology. Yes, it's shifting our relationships to time, to space and to one another, but we also have an incredible opportunity to foster connection, to foster relationships and presence. So my hope is that you can go forth and listen deeply ask questions, and meet young people on the journey. Thank you. Questions. Bethany, thank you so much. I feel like I'm like your, uh, your audience here. <laughs> Yay. That was great. Wow. Um, I, Tracy, uh, Tracy shared that she heard back from her son immediately. He had used Snapchat to say hello to a cousin in another state. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I've, when I've been in workshops 
and people have done um, is what you had suggested, you know, show me um, a photo that's meaningful to you, you know, from the last month or, or so. And I think, you know, we have these devices with us pretty much all the time and we carry around what matters in these devices uh, all the time, right? The pictures, the contact information. And so these relationships, you know, our, our credit card, maybe on Apple pay or your Starbucks app or, or whatever, all the things that these things that are so important, you're carrying around in your uh, pocket or in your purse um, and opening up a conversation that's uh, around that. And that assumes that that exists, you know, that that's there with us um, is a really pretty easy way of, of getting a conversation started with people, whether they're um, with teens or adults. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think, I don't think we have any more questions at the moment. We might've gotten them all on the last, on the last rounds. Sounds great. Well, um, and if you have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email or a message on Facebook um, or on the Twitters, <laughs> any <laughs> social media platforms, because um, I love to talk about this stuff and think about the relationship between um, technology, faith formation, and youth ministry. Awesome. Um, it's been so great to, uh, to have you and thank you for this amazing content and perspective. One of the parents had said that uh, it was nice to hear a positive perspective about social media. And it's true because so much of what we hear is just all fearful and scary. And to think about how, you know, we grew up going to the malls and figuring out who we were by going to the mall and awkwardly walking down and saying hello to people and, and, and all of that. And now, um, you know, these are the, the new malls, these new networked publics that you describe. Um, and I think, you know, having heard you share some of this before, it really, I think, engenders a sense of empathy for teens today and all the pressures they're facing and having to learn who they are in front of everybody else mm -hmm. um, and how challenging that can be. And, and there's a longer trail that you don't necessarily anticipate, especially as you think about um, cognitive development and emotional and social development for teens, that there's a legacy that they're leaving that they may not think through. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good. Well, I'm going to check Facebook one more time for any questions and I don't see any, but I see lots of thank yous. So, and I, and I share that too. Thank you so much. And uh, we are going to sign off now. Um, so I'm going to press the button <laughs> and here we go. Thank you everybody for tuning in. This is a really good experiment. And, uh, uh, and uh, all the links are shared in the comments and you can check those out. And uh, Beth and I are both available if you wanna talk anymore or have any more questions. So Thank thanks, you. bye.